So this era has become very, very synonymous with the word COVID-19. A lot of patients are coming in with respiratory symptoms. And given that I actually had a chance to work in the COVID department during uh, the third and the fourth wave, actually got exposed to a lot of these oxygen devices, how to have a, a pretty basic understanding of oxygen therapy, how to escalate oxygen therapy, especially for your patients that come in with respiratory conditions. And I thought this is actually a good start to actually impact this knowledge that I have on someone else that may have some difficulty because a lot of people actually do not understand the basics of escalating oxygen therapy and the devices to use when you're escalating this oxygen. So this was actually a good lecture that I thought of and I was like, why shouldn't I do this? So grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is here on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at oxygen therapy. This is a practical guide, so I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. I don't want to go into a lot of details of the science in this, so I'll just keep it as basic as possible, something that you can use on the words that will give you enough knowledge to keep your patients alive. I will give out detailed lectures, especially when you talk about the non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilations, the CPAP and the BiPAP. I'll go into details of those, but not in this particular lecture. And also details of intubation and putting patients on vents a bit later on. But for now, let's actually have a focus on oxygen therapy and how we escalate the oxygen therapy. I won't go into much detail about de-escalation of oxygen therapy. I will actually set that as a separate video of how we actually de-escalate. So this will actually focus mainly on just escalation of oxygen in patients. So let's just jump right in. Remember, oxygen is like a drug, so it must be prescribed. So remember that escalating as well as de-escalating oxygen must be done in an appropriate manner, in a progressive manner. And this is because we want to prevent oxygen therapy related complications. If we give too much oxygen at High flow rates, we can cause problems. We can cause bowel trauma. We can sometimes cause uh, what is known as, um, we can worsen patients with COPDs. If you give very high flows of high concentrations of oxygen, we can worsen the COPD by increasing the carbon dioxide that's being retained in this person's body and thereby worsening the condition and you can actually kill them. So it means this has to be done in a controlled manner. And oxygen should be given whenever it is indicated. And remember that not all patients actually need to be placed on oxygen. Most of the times people think if someone comes in and they're breathless, that they need oxygen. It's not always. You always have to address the underlying cause. If the underlying cause is addressed, then they may not necessarily need oxygen. But I'm not saying that for all your breathless patients, don't give them oxygen. No, you have to put it into perspective, many other things. So remember oxygen is prescribed to relieve hypoxemia. That's what we want to prevent hypoxemia, low concentrations of oxygen in the bloodstream. And we do not want to prevent breathlessness. Okay, that's the essence of that. Another important thing that you want to actually keep in mind is that some people have this trigger where they just assume that the low saturations is equals to oxygen. So it's not always that your low saturations are going to be equal to oxygen. There are many other factors that you actually have to consider. And I'll teach you some of these factors and some of the things that you have to look out for when you're escalating a patient from one oxygen device to the next oxygen device when you're increasing the amount of oxygen that you're going to be giving. So remember that oxygen is going to be the first line of therapy that we're going to be giving for patients in respiratory distress, those that have hypoxemia, those that need supplemental oxygen. And generally, we want to improve their work of breathing. So in patients that do not have any chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure or anything of that sort that I mean COPDs and related conditions we generally want to keep their oxygen saturation above 92 percent for those that have COPDs and all these other uh, things we want to keep them between 88 to 92 percent and if you have done everything you can you have escalated the oxygen therapy in a very progressive manner in the correct way you have titrated it well and the patient is still not improving and the 
they actually have respiratory failure or you have failed to actually improve their stats, then you may need to intubate this patient. This video is not focused much on intubation, it's focused much on the oxygen devices and escalation of oxygen therapy. So I think that you want to keep in mind is this. Remember we're at sea level. So remember that air is a mixture of gases. We have oxygen, carbon dioxide, other gases, nitrogen, which makes a big portion of the air that we breathe in. And oxygen is only 21% of that. So keep this in level, in mind rather, is at sea level, we have 21% of oxygen. The higher we go, as we increase altitude, the concentration of oxygen, actually the percentage of oxygen in the air decreases. So it means that if you actually ascend to a mountain, you're going to be actually having less percentage of oxygen and there'll be less tendency of oxygen to diffuse across your pulmonary capillaries. So it means that you may actually have some sort of hypoxia. So there are some different oxygen tools. I'll show you some pictures so that you actually familiarize yourself with them. So that the next time you see them on the WAD, you will be able to actually have a good grasp of how these devices work, what you would expect from them, how much maximum flow rate can you actually give. So we have nasal cannulae, we have simple face mask, venturi mask, which I, I doubt you may see most of these, but the simple face mask you will see, the nasal cannulae you will see, the narrow breather masks you will see. High flow nasal cannula, I think I saw this only in the ICU at the place where I work. I saw these in the ICU. So if you actually swing by the ICU, you can actually have a look at this high flow nasal cannulae. Then the non-invasive ventilation or the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation also, which you can see in ICU. You won't see this mostly on the wads. You see it in the ICU. So what are some of the things that you want to consider before you actually start a patient on oxygen? Remember that escalation of oxygen is as important as de-escalation. I will talk about de-escalation in a different video. So this video is just focused mainly on escalation of oxygen. And remember, at each step that you're going to be going, I'll give you basic steps that you're going to be starting from. And I'll be keeping in mind that we'll be using our model patient being someone who has a respiratory illness, for example, a COVID-19. So the things that you have to consider, three things. So you first have to consider the patient. So is the patient comfortable? Are they any in, in any distress? How do you know they're in distress? If they are quite young, you may even have nasal flaring, but you generally have use of accessory muscles, of respiration, and of course you're going to be having an increased respiratory rate, increased work of breathing. So how is their work of breathing? Is it labored? A good way to actually test this is actually try and match the patient's respiratory rate. When you look at the patient, try and breathe in and out, breathe in and out, follow their pattern. If you're lagging behind, meaning that this person is breathing, their respiratory rate is quite high. So the work of breathing is actually uh, quite significant. Then the second thing that you want to look at is the oxygen saturation. So this is using pulse oximetry. Of course, it has some disadvantages. For example, if a patient has cold peripheries, the, the values that you may get may not be so accurate. So you should actually keep in mind with um, this pulse oximetry. But generally, your target is going to be between 88 to 92% for those that have COPDs and other related conditions that have chronic respiratory failure because you do not want to keep increasing the carbon dioxide concentration in their body and because they need actually need a bit of some hypoxia to keep driving their respiratory centers. Then for the rest of the individuals that do not have these conditions, you want to keep their saturations greater than 92%. So it means if someone has a COPD, if they're hitting 90% oxygen saturation, you won't rush to put them on oxygen. You would put them on oxygen if they're hitting less than 88% percent saturation. Same thing for those that do not have any other of these conditions. If they are hitting less than 92 percent, then you want to start to consider to put them on oxygen. And remember, at any point in the escalation, you may actually choose to reposition the patient or put them in a different position. If they are conscious, they can actually reposition themselves to a, a, a position where they actually feel more comfortable, and this may actually help you improve their saturations. Remember that patients, this is what I was stressing upon, patients that have COPDs, patients that have carbon dioxide narcosis, these conditions are going to be like chronic respiratory insufficiency. So they're going to be resulting in hypercapnia, which is an increase in carbon dioxide partial pressure. So if you over-administer oxygen, this is going to reduce the hypoxic 
drive. It's going to reduce the respiratory drive. So this is going to lead to their respiratory um, centers being depressed and not firing as they should. So it means this is going to lead to further accumulation of carbon dioxide in their system. So further hypercapnia that's going to be. So they may even have altered mental status. They may have respiratory collapse. So we just we generally want to titrate the oxygen at low doses. This is very, very important in patients that have COPDs. Then in neonates, on the other hand, if you actually give high levels of oxygen in neonates, this puts them at risk of developing retinopathy of prematurity, where you have this neovascularization of the retina, they may have vision loss, they may have blindness. So we want to administer vitamin E to be a protective thing in infants that are requiring supplemental oxygen. But mostly this lecture is going to be focused in adults, so I won't go into details of how we give oxygen in children, that will be a lecture for another day. And in patients that actually need oxygenation, other ways to increase oxygenation to reach the target SpO2 may include the following things. So if they have underlying cause, make sure you treat that. If they have an anemia, transfuse the patient. This may actually help the patient. If the cardiac output is very low, you can improve the cardiac output. Treat the heart failure if they, they are in heart failure. If there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch, chest physio can actually help this. You can give them mucolytics if the... the uh, airways are blocked with mucus. So this may help to actually increase the oxygenation without actually you necessarily increasing the amount of oxygen that you're giving to this patient. So one contraindication that I can actually think of in relation to giving oxygen is paraquat poisoning. So this is actually a common herbicide and it's actually quite toxic to humans. And when we give oxygen, we worsen the condition because we actually trigger this reduction in oxidation reactions that can actually cause more damage in a patient. I won't go into details much of this because I promised I won't go into a lot of the science. So remember that oxygen administration can actually be, can actually increase the insensible losses, especially if you're giving dry oxygen, it's not humidified, it'll dry up the airways. So generally, this is very, very common at high flow rates of oxygen. So remember the flow rate is how fast this oxygen. Do not confuse flow rate with a percentage of oxygen. Percentage of oxygen is what is the amount of oxygen that you have in this air? What's the percentage? For example, it could be 21%, 25%, 20%, 28%, 60%, 40%, so on and so forth. The flow rate is how fast this oxygen is moving. So you can have 20% flowing at three liters per minute. So do not confuse flow rate together with um, the, the fraction of inspired oxygen that is present or the percentage of the oxygen that you are pushing in. So remember that to prevent this dryness of the airway, we want to humidify the air. So we do this when we're actually using high flow rates for a longer period of time and for patients that have tracheostomies. But actually this may increase expectoration in patients that have bronchiectasis. It may increase the phlegm that is there. And in vulnerable patients, actually, administration of cool or even cold oxygen can actually increase the risk of hypothermia. And so this can actually be mitigated by actually warming the, the oxygen and humidifying it. And then remember that as you increase the fraction of inspired oxygen, which is how much oxygen you have in the air that you're pumping into this patient, what's the percentage of oxygen? You can think of that as the uh, fraction of inspired oxygen. So we increase the oxygen toxicity because remember, not everything that is good in large amounts is actually good for you. It can actually cause harm. So high concentrations of oxygen can actually lead to formation of these superoxide ions, these free radicals. So these are hydroxyl radicals, which can actually even damage the alveoli. It can lead to decrease in lung compliance. It can lead to diffusion capacity decrease. It can lead to decreased levels of oxygen partial pressure levels in the arteries. So uh, arterioles rather and arteries. So actually we do not want to give high concentrations of oxygen for a sustained period of time. And remember that the lung changes in oxygen toxicity are going to be including things like alveolar and even interstitial edema, alveolar hemorrhages, even proteinaceous exudates that we can see on pathology. And with this prolonged oxygen exposure, you can actually lead to what is known as a proliferative phase where there is proliferation of this type two pneumocytes. Remember that type two Pneumocytes or the type 2 epithelial cells are the ones that are going to be producing the surfactant. They're the ones that are predominantly going to be the stem cells of the lungs. There's also going to be proliferation of fibroblasts, which can lead to deposition of collagen. So remember that exposure to fractions of oxygen greater than 60% for as little as 24 to 48 hours can actually lead to severe irreversible pulmonary fibrosis. So which is why I said we do not want to give these concentrations for too long.
Okay, so let me not bore you so much on the science. Let's now go into the devices and actually have a good understanding of these devices. So I hope at this point you have understood everything that I've talked about. If you don't, you can pause the video here, rewind and rewatch that bit because this is not going to make sense if the first half didn't make sense. So we'll start off with the nasal cannula, which is the one that you're commonly going to be using. So advantage of this is that the patient can talk, the patient can eat, so it doesn't cover the entire face. Although, if they actually have a respiratory illness, say a COVID-19, every time they exhale, the particles can actually be dispersed as far as 40 centimeters, especially if the flow rate is above five liters per minute, meaning that if you're using, um, a, a, if a patient has an infectious process and they're not even in a negative pressure room and they're put on a nasal cannula, they can actually spread the particles. They can aerosolize the particles in the room and as far as 40 centimeters. So it means this patient must be using this nasal cannula and they must actually wear a surgical face mask. I know it may look weird, but this is what is actually recommended. So with these nasal cannula, it's actually the preferred oxygen delivery because it's simple to apply. There's very little variation that you can do in terms of the percentage of oxygen and of course the flow rates can also be easily adjusted so this can actually give you a flow rate between two to six liters per minute so minimum of two liters per minute maximum of six liters per minute if you're giving one liter per minute that's almost insignificant the disadvantage of this remember i say that oxygen at sea level as a percentage of about 21 percent so remember we do not want to give 100% pure oxygen for prolonged levels or prolonged amounts or prolonged periods of time. So we generally want to vary the percentage of oxygen. But the bad thing about this is that this variation, you can't really control it. You can't control the variation with the nasal cannula. It varies. You can't tell whether this is giving 25%, whether it's giving 30%, whether it's giving 40%. So you can't really tell how much percentage of oxygen is being given, but generally it's going to vary between 24 to 40%. So that's one disadvantage of these nasal cannulae is that you can't really control the percentage of oxygen that you're giving. In a patient with COPDs, this actually matters. Why? Because you really generally want to give them low concentrations or low doses of oxygen as opposed to giving them high doses of oxygen. So if the if you have put this patient now on the, the for example, two to six liters per minute, of oxygen, then you monitor their saturations, you monitor their work of breathing, you monitor their respiratory rate. Then if the patient isn't improving, you move to the next step. So this is the first step, the nasal cannulae. If this isn't working, you move to the next step. So the next step is of course a simple face mask. These are, of course, you will see them also quite commonly on the ward. So this is what a face mask looks like. So it has no bag that's attached to it here. And this can actually also vary the concentration of oxygen that you're giving. It's not really a fixed amount or you can't really vary the percentage of oxygen that you're giving. But the flow rate here is much higher than what you can give with the nasal cannulae. So these ones can be from two to 10 liters per minute. So they, are, they give you a, a higher flow rate than do the nasal cannulae. So they are actually quite superior to the nasal cannulae. But these ones are less superior to another type of face mask that I'll introduce in the next slide, which is known as a Venturi mask. So if you have a Venturi mask, you and a patient that has a COPD, they would rather you'd rather start them on the Venturi mask as opposed to the simple face mask. Because these ones are less precise in controlling how much oxygen that you're giving, the percentage, the fraction of inspired oxygen. So these ones should not be used in patients with hypercapnia or those that have type 2 respiratory failure. So there's a risk of carbon dioxide accumulation within the mask uh, as well as them inspiring this carbon dioxide, especially if the flow rates is actually less than five liters per minute. So this is what a venturi mask actually looks like. So here with this venturi mask, you have air that's going to be mixing with oxygen. Now, as you can see, it has an extension here, which is going to be connected to the simple face mask. So it comes in actually different colors, which you can actually change off. And depending on the color that you have, it will give you the amount or the percentage of oxygen that you're actually going to be delivering into this person's um, 
system. So if you have a blue color, it's about 24%, a white one is about 28%, a yellow one is about 35%, a red one is about 40% and the green one which is shown here, which is the largest percentage, 60%. So this one can also range between a flow rate of 2 to 15 liters per minute. So suppose you started off a patient that came in with COVID, for example, and you started them off with a simple face mask. I mean, rather not a simple face mask, a nasal cannula at 5 liters per minute. They're not improving. You maybe escalated them to 6 liters per minute. They're not improving. You have reached the maximum of that. You now switch them to a Venturi mask, where now you're going to be starting them off at a higher percentage, a higher, uh, what do you call this, flow rate. But remember, as you increase the flow rate, you should also be increasing the percentage of oxygen that you're giving, unless if this patient has a COPD or one of those chronic respiratory failure conditions that may actually contraindicate them from receiving higher doses of oxygen. So for those that have COPDs, you want to give them at 24 to 28 percent so that's either a blue one or a white one so as the percentage of inspired air actually increases using this mask the air to oxygen ratio actually decreases so you can actually with high flow rates you can actually give a maximum concentration of about 40 percent so we should titrate the the percentages of the fraction of inspired oxygen up to 60% depending on the patient's symptoms, depending on the saturations, depending on the arterial blood gases. This also has a risk of dispersing particles, especially in infectious patients, up to four centimeters. So you can actually put this on and then cover it with a surgical mask in the patients that, ha that have infectious conditions. If you don't have this available, you can use a non-rebreather mask, which I'll show you very shortly in a few slides later on. You can use a non-rebreather mask, which has a bag, which actually acts as a reservoir and keeps some of the oxygen such that the bag can actually contain almost 100% oxygen within it. So this also has the risk of dispersing, aerosolizing the particles, so actually it should be covered with a face mask over. So this is how a uh, venturi mask actually works. So like I said, you're going to have oxygen that is flowing. So let's say you have oxygen here flowing at a rate of eight liters per minute. So remember this oxygen that is coming from the oxygen tank is going to be mixed. This jet of oxygen will be mixed with air. So the size of the inlets depends on the color. So the size of the inlets will actually now depend on how much air you're going to be mixing with the oxygen that's coming in as a jet. Then eventually this will give you a final percentage of how much oxygen this patient is going to be inspiring. So how much oxygen has been mixed with the O2 that's coming from the machine together with the room air. So in this case, this person is going to have a 35% of 8 liters per minute of oxygen. So this is pretty much a schematic of how they actually work. So these are the different colors again to stress the point. So here, 24% up to 2 liters per minute, 35% up to 8 liters per minute, 31% up to 6 liters per minute, 28% up to 4 liters per minute, 40% up to 10 liters per minute, and 60%, which should be the largest, up to 15 liters per minute. Then we have the non-rebreather mask. As you can see, here's a non-rebreather mask with a bag there. So this one has a reservoir and it has a one-way valve, such that now the oxygen will keep accumulating in this bag to a point where you can actually even be inhaling 100% of the oxygen at even higher flow rates per, lit per liter per minute. So this can actually allow oxygen to uh, accumulate within this bag such that you can even have higher concentrations from about 60 to 90% and the flow rate will be about 10 to 15 liters per minute. As you can see, there is an increase in flow. We started off from the nasal cannula, which is going to be giving you from two to about six liters per minute. We went on to the face masks, which can give you two to a maximum of 15. So when we're looking at the Venturi mask, it's about two to 10. They can even, you can push them up to 15 from this previous diagram here. These ones can actually, the green ones can go up to 15. Then the non rebreather, generally we start them from 10 liters per minute up to 15 liters per minute. So these masks are used in emergencies, but they are rather imprecise. They're not as precise as the, the Venturi masks and actually for those that require controlled oxygen therapy, you should avoid them. Sorry about my phone. For those that actually require oxygen therapy, you should actually... For those that require oxygen therapy, you should actually use the Venturi masks. Then 
if that doesn't work, you then want to combine your non-rebreather mask and the nasal cannula. So the non-rebreather mask is going to be put at the maximum of six liters per minute. The Actually, the nasal cannula at six liters per minute, the non-rebreather mask at 15 liters per minute. So you'll be giving a total of about 21 liters per minute of oxygen, theoretically speaking. Then if still the patient doesn't improve, despite you now escalating from your nasal cannula to your simple face mask to your ventry mask, if you have a ventry mask, then you start now combining your non-rebreather mask plus your your nasal cannula and still this patient does not improve, then you want to escalate to a high flow nasal cannula. So now this high flow nasal cannula is advantageous. Why is this so? Number one, it can actually heat up the air. It can heat up the air, warm the air, it can humidify the air and you can actually set diffraction of inspired oxygen at a very high level. So you can actually even give 100% of oxygen, the uh, humidified oxygen 100% and at high flow rates. Remember that with the nasal cannula is a high variation of the fraction of inspired oxygen and also the flow rates are not so high. But with these high flow nasal cannula, you can actually set it up at 100% fraction of inspired oxygen and then you can actually even set up the flow rate even to as high as 60 liters per minute. So it means 60 liters per minute, you can even give up to 100 uh, percent of fraction of inspired oxygen. Remember that these cannulae are also capable of humidifying the oxygen and they're capable of flow rates that are exceeding the inspiratory pressure of the patient. So normally, in normal individuals that do not have COVID but rather are indicated for oxygen therapy, we want to start off by starting the flow rate roughly at around 20 to 30 liters per minute. Then we titrate the fraction of inspired oxygen until we have our desired SpO2 until we, the patient is no longer in significant distress and if there's no hypoxemia. But in COVID patients, we actually do the opposite. We actually start off by setting the fraction of inspired oxygen at 100. Then after that, we set the rate at 20 to 30 liters per minute. Then we titrate the rate upwards until we reach a maximum of 60 liters per minute. This is based on the patient's comfort level. It's based on the saturations. It's based on generally the work of breathing of the patients. But the thing to keep in mind is that the higher rates that you have, the more uncomfortable the patient is actually going to be. So there is a score that you can actually do to predict whether this is going to work or it won't work. It's known as the ROX index. So this is done at 2, 6, and 12 hours. So how do you calculate this ratio? So you say the SpO2 divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen Everything, the answer that you get, you divide that by the respiratory rate. So if you do it and you get a value that's greater than 4.88, then it me this means that this patient is likely to do well. But there's a table that actually shows this. Let me just show you this table. So here's how you calculate the index. So the SpO2 divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen divided by the respiratory rate. Let me give you an example here. So suppose someone presented oh, at six hours, of them being on a high flow nasal cannulae, their saturation is at 88%. Their fraction of inspired oxygen is 0 0.70. So that's 70%. And their respiratory rate is 28 breaths per minute. So you say 88 divided by 0 0.70, you divide everything by 28. That gives you a value of 4.48. Now, if we look at this table over here, so we have two hours, six hours, 12 hours, greater than 12 hours. So it means this patient is at six hours. So for all the patients that have a value less than 3.47, 98 to 99, so virtually all the patients will fail. So it means they won't succeed. But this patient has a value that's higher than 3.47. So it means they are bound to succeed. This is a good thing. You should keep them on the high flow nasal cannulae. But of course, this keep in mind that this index has only been tested on a small sample of patients and requires more validation. So the best thing is to always use your clinical judgment. Then if the high nasal flow cannulae has failed, you can now escalate them to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is the final step before we intubate the patient. So here you have two choices. You can either put the patient on continuous positive airway pressure, which is known as CPAP, or you can put them on bilevel a positive airway pressure, which is known as BiPAP. So these two modes can actually be 
switched on the machine and actually it provides this positive pressure through a respiratory cycle. I won't go into details of this and of course this is through this tightly fitting face mask. So the specific mode and which settings we use actually differs for different indications. Even in COVID, it's actually been under so much debate. There are some people that actually say that C CPAP is actually recommended because it improves the oxygenation, it reduces the lung injury. So remember that patients that are put on CPAP are going to have them receiving high amounts of amine arterial airway pressure, while it's those that are going to be put on BiPAP are going to be assisted with the ventilation, are going to be assisted with those, for example, those that have COVID-19 plus maybe an obstructive lung disease or maybe a cardiac pathology. So if they have these things, then you can put them on BiPAP, otherwise you want to put them on CPAP. If this fails, then you of course want to actually intubate these patients. But this is like a very, very basic thing. There's a whole lot of details and a whole lot of science behind the continuous positive airway pressure and the bi-level positive airway pressure. So I will go into details of that much later on. If you want a video on that, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon, and of course, drop a comment in the comment section below. So here is a table of everything that I almost everything that we've talked about. So we start off with a nasal cannula, we escalate that to a venturi mask, but in between here you can add a simple face mask. If that doesn't work, then we can escalate that to a non-rebreather mask plus a nasal cannula. If this doesn't work, we escalate to our high flow nasal cannula. If this doesn't work, we escalate to a non-invasive positive airway pressure. If this doesn't work, that's when the patient actually needs intubation. But the advent of this CPAP and BiPAP actually has reduced the incidence of patients being uh, intubated, especially even in our COVID era. So here is a last table to actually give you a very practical guide of how oxygen sh actually should be given and how oxygen should be delivered. So I will just go through it very quickly. So we have a patient here that has like, suspected hypoxia and you want to start oxygen therapy. So you want to start by getting your oxygen saturation, okay? And you ask yourself, is this patient at risk of hypercapnic respiratory failure? In essence, does this patient has COPDs and other related conditions? For example, chest wall deformities, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, neuromuscular disorders, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome. If they don't, if their saturation is greater than 92%, they don't need oxygen. So they just need them to be monitored continuously. If their saturation is now for less than 92%, then we start them on oxygen. If they are between 85 to 91%, we start them on about two to four liters nasal cannula or any other suitable oxygen delivery method. I've talked of many of them during the lecture. Then of course, we titrate the oxygen to achieve our goal of 92 to 96%. We also consider doing arterial blood gases. We should monitor the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which should be less than 40 five millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of oxygen should be greater than 60 millimeters of mercury. So we monitor these and we titrate until we keep their saturations between 92 to 96. Now suppose this patient keeps falling and their saturations are less than 85%. We start them on four liters nasal cannulae you can escalate that to 5 to 10 liters via a simple mask. You can escalate that to 15 liters per minute of 100% a non-rebreather mask. You can escalate that even further with a non-rebreather mask plus a nasal cannula. You can escalate that to a high flow nasal cannula greater than 35% of a fraction of inspired oxygen. Of course, titrate this to keep our goal is greater than 92%, 92 to 96%. So our partial pressure of oxygen should be greater than uh, 60%, our partial pressure of carbon dioxide should be less than 45%. If this is not the case, you're still doing this and the patient has a partial pressure of, ox of carbon dioxide greater than 45, that pH is even dropping to less than 7.35, their oxygen partial pressure is dropping to less than 60 millimeters of mercury. Despite them being put on a high flow oxygen device, you may consider them having non-invasive ventilation. You may consider transferring them to an ICU or a high dependency ward. Of course, if this still doesn't work, you consider intubating the patient. Now, if a patient has a COPD or related things, remember what, that your target here is 88 to 92%. So if their saturations are greater than 88%, they don't need oxygen. Just continue monitoring their saturations. Make sure that between 88 to 92. If they keep falling below 88%, we start them on low flow oxygen. So one to two liters per minute via nasal cannula, a two to four liters via 24% or 28% venturi mask. 
make sure that the target is between 88 to 92. Then if their pH keeps falling and their partial pressures of oxygen increase, we may consider the non-invasive ventilation, we may consider the intubation, we may consider taking them to ICU. So this is just actually a summary of everything that I have been talking about. I really hope it has made sense. You may actually take your time, take a screenshot of this, zoom in, read in. I can actually send you a copy of this if you actually need a copy of this. Now, I want you to always remember these things. So remember that the use of high concentration of oxygen in a breathless patient in an attempt to actually prevent them from tipping them into hypoxemia can actually even delay the inevitable. So it's actually going to be uh, delaying the recognition of clinical deterioration and it actually can reduce the time available to actually initiate additional therapy. So it's not always that if a patient is breathless, let's give them high concentrations of oxygen. The second thing that you want to keep in note is that if the patient actually requires high concentrations, high fraction of inspired oxygen to maintain the oxygen saturation, if they suddenly deteriorate, then there is limited opportunity for you to increase the such the the oxygen percentage to avoid them going going into hypoxemia. So it means such patients actually need to be managed by a senior clinician. They need to be managed in an area where it's possible for them to be put on the non-invasive ventilation. It's possible for them to be placed on to be intubated and placed on a vent. I really hope that made a lot of sense and I hope you understood about oxygen escalation, oxygen therapy, and the different oxygen devices we have on the ward. If you did enjoy this video, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon because it helps the, notif the, the notification, geez, it helps the channel grow. If you did, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.